Hey everybody, Adam Savage and I am with my friend Katie Coleman, astronaut, and we are at the Udvar Hazy Center from the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And we're in this really special place because this is the Friendship 7 John Glenn's capsule, first American in space. First American to orbit the first planet. I mean, because everything before that was suborbital, so he went like all the way, <laughs> several times. And that was a, it was a significant difference in the length of flight too, yes, right? Yes, like almost five hours. Wow. Yeah, compared to like an hour and a half or, yeah, it's a big okay. deal. The thing that I noticed, this has been behind glass at the downtown museum for years and years and years, and I've only seen it there. Seeing it up this close is blowing my mind. First of all, all the little bolts holding the exterior panels on are Phillips head screws. These are all little hex bolts. I mean, it feels so handmade. I'm like, my mind is kind of blown. I mean, almost like, you know, you took all the mechanics in town. You said, OK, our job is to build a space castle. Yeah. And, and I mean, using parts that everybody knows. And I don't mean to belittle the engineering that went into it, but it makes it look like we could do this, too, which you could. Well, I wouldn't. And we I would were, help. We were looking at the, uh, the Starship Enterprise from the original Star Trek series recently. And we were talking about how all those smooth lines speak to the future. Well, it's, I mean, because it's this beautiful, futuristic, you know, the saucer at the front. And right. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and I, it suddenly dawned on me when people see, like, this is the ship that we're going to go to the moon in, which is a capsule because physics hasn't changed. Like, right. There is some there is some just you feel it disappointment. And it's because they think Star Trek in the future is going to be so streamlined. But this is physics. This, this is, is the best way. If you're going to go and you want to come back, this is the best way. So I look at this and I, I can't, it's hard for me to wrap my head around how tiny this is smaller than any car I've ever owned volumetrically. But I think about being in that cabin. Now you've actually flown on the Soyuz up and down, right? True. Yep. Okay. Can you describe to me some of that experience? I mean, so the Soyuz, I mean, John Glenn was one person in this small ship. We are three. Our ship is not that much bigger because we are actually like scooched very you know, like so here, like shoulder to here. Shoulder. We are. I mean, there's three of us. Your knees are actually like have little holders on them to keep them from going like that. You know, wow. I mean, so it's really tight. And um, and yet once you get up in space, it's actually bigger. And in fact, we do have the luxury of having one extra sort of living room, so to speak. So you're not it's just strapped to chairs next to for, each other. Not for that day. So for our crew, we, we were in the, the groups that still got to we launch, you know, from Baikonur. Yeah. And then we take about a day and a half, almost two. Really? To just basically, it's just us in our little Soyuz orbiting the planet. And I felt I felt like I was in the same place that they were. Amazing. No, I mean, not some big space shuttle, not yeah. some big rocket. I mean, it's just you three in our capsule plus our extra living room, so to speak, that has a window. And it's just, it's this magical place because it's just, there's so little structure between you and space. You feel yeah. like you are really in space. And this spacecraft, I think it's like a millimeter the metal is, right? Yeah. I, you're describing it as a thrilling thing, but it also sounds kind of terrifying. Not, not, and, and not, and actually not so much thrilling, but just so meaningful. So meaningful. Like right. yeah. we, this is what being a human in space is like. It's not about our ship because our ship is barely here. It's right. so small. Right. It's really us. You described this to me off camera as something you wear. Yes. <laughs> like, and I think it was actually John Glenn's uh, phrase was, you know, you, you don't like strap into the spacecraft. You, you just strap you strap it on. on. <laughs> you wear your spacecraft. OK, so you go up in the in the Soyuz. What's the reason you spend a whole day and a half before getting to um, just it. Well, first of all, there's tradition like there's it, they used to it take take a while to make sure to check out the new systems and also when the Russians were first launching, they're using only their communication sites. Right. The antennas right. on their spacecraft would only talk to their communication sites until we all started doing things together, right? right. And so, it, you know, an hour and a half later after launch, now you can check things out. Yeah. Another, and, and just making, and also making sure everybody feels well, which, okay. you know, more than half of us, I've had flights where I felt terrific and flights where I did not at first. <laughs> you know? Sure. And we have, you know, ways of dealing with that and the best designed, you know, bar fags. I mean, they work and it's just like here. You kind of go, oh, do I feel like this? Oh, I do. And then, you know, throw up and then you feel better. I, so I remember being on a zero G flight where I threw up into my bag and I finished throwing up and I moved the bag mm -hmm. away. And then I realized, oh, nothing is holding 
my emetic in this bag, I better close it. <laughs> yes. And actually, we have almost like handkerchiefs sewn onto the bag oh, so wow. that when you do that, you get to like wipe your mouth and everything. That's highly the good stuff. That's yeah. awesome. Yes. Back to Friendship 7. Back to Friendship 7. <laughs> I mean, you have directly experienced meeting the crews that put together the ships and the pieces that took you to and home from space. But the rest of us have to settle for seeing things like this up close and understanding that thousands and thousands of people dedicated whole portions of their lives to getting this thing off the ground. And I mean, there's I mean, there's diagrams, there's plans, there's a way. I mean, if you were going to make another one, there's a plan to do that. But when it really comes down to it, it is everyone knowing they're part of that assembly, that there might be this little difference or when to say something doesn't quite look right here or yeah. doesn't look like the diagram. I mean, it is real people doing their very best. And without it, there's no way we'd be going and coming back. I'm curious if you you must have, after the fact, met people that worked on systems that got you to space. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, especially the tile folks for the shuttle. Oh, really? And I mean, where, you know, the shuttle, it's like a it's like a jigsaw puzzle of tiles underneath. And they specialize in different parts of the of the you know underbelly. And so different people know different parts of the topography. Exactly. Of, okay. Exactly. And how they fit together. And. And, you know, and just, each one is slightly different. Each section is has its own sort of potential exactly. Flow. And wow. even on each ship, they can be different depending on. I mean, because the designs evolve, and then you know, damage happens, and then they you know redo things. But I mean, people know their part of that. Yeah. And and everybody everybody knows their part is essential. And in fact, as astronauts, one of our things that we get to do is go around and go to the places where things are either made or prepared or put together and look people in the eye and you don't even have to say anything you they just, just get the fact that they matter that's beautiful I, I love that the heat shield on this mercury capsule is like the direct predecessor of the beautiful heat shields the all ten thousand we can see on the bottom of the shuttle on the other side of the camera exactly and when we were looking for how can we repair something for the bottom of the shuttle right when you know after columbia looking at you know this is a reality we yeah. might have tiles that are damaged what what can we do we actually turned to the same kind of we call them ablative materials because they're just actually designed i mean the back of the, these heat shields they're designed to burn up on the way in right. on purpose but there's calculations that go into that, that there is enough to burn up, but not so much that it's too heavy that it doesn't re-enter properly or it has uneven aerodynamics. So let's talk re-entry because you came back in a Soyuz capsule. You it was experienced awesome. the heat. <laughs> Tell me about this. Tell me what this is well, like. Well, Scott, Scott Kelly is the crew who landed right before us. And okay. so traditionally they will brief the crew that's about to land. And we'll let you know goes, how rough it's going to be. Okay, Coleman, two things. First, this is like the e-ticket ride. You are going to love this. And second, you know, parachute opening shock. Make sure you are not talking. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> you'll bite your tongue. Exactly. I mean, so for, before that, I mean, we're, he goes, so, you know, big picture, you've got an ablative heat shield. You are going to see pieces of burning spacecraft go by your window. It is okay. <laughs> And, 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 you know, even though we know that yeah. there's training, there's descriptions, we know that. But having somebody that you know say, this this is the way this is going to be. Still, when those blazing pieces go by, I mean, it really does happen that way. Wow. And counting down and you really feel like the heat inside. The you feel it gets hot inside? You it does. To, wow. It definitely, definitely warms even up. Even now. And I did have this timer counting down, too. So we have like the, the drogue shoots come out. Yeah. And I mean, you're falling, falling, falling fast and that that capsule literally stops when those shoots come out and then it is spinning and swinging and that is the oh wow pretty, it is i mean it is not just like what you imagine i had in never the car. considered it, it is a very when i very active event and the parachutes came out that was when everything got quiet but that's just the beginning of your exactly ride. exactly Whoa. it was pretty and it so i was glad i had that timer to not be <laughs> talking at that time <laughs> <laughs> Did they give you a warning that the shoots are going to open or you just have to know? No, what? I mean, we have a timeline. We know, okay. we right. know what's going to happen. And then, and now you're just waiting and you know, I mean, in, in, in suddenly, you know, where you could look for that exact time. And we never really thought, I mean, it's one thing to go, yeah, landing will happen at that time, yeah. but it's another thing to be like waiting for that. And we still actually have couches, so to speak, just like John Glenn had in the spacecraft with, that are molded to you. Right. They've cast you for your seat. We call it the spa day. You know, where you literally, you are in, you are in a bathtub, 
and you know, and like a white, you know, sort of long underwear kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, and then they pour plaster of Paris around you, and then they they take you out with a crane. Um, <laughs> And then there's an artist who's got a big gray beard, who's the person who has carved out everybody's seats, we think since Gagarin, and who actually allows for the difference between you and, and your sp suit, carves this thing. And and the whole reason it's so seat. customized is to perfectly balance all the G-loads across your to whole body. To spread it across. And yeah. we also have shock absorbers, so that when we do land, right. then we do have that sort of stroke of the seat to take up some of that as well and so then what but then sometimes it depends on the wind the capsule will maybe get dragged by the chutes and maybe there's rolling over we landed sort of straight you land but, on land but i looked out the window we do oh in, in the thought, soyuz we land oh, on land i somehow thought you still landed on water i didn't realize nope. that Soyuz is on land. Some of the other capsules, SpaceX is on water. Yeah. I mean, they both have advantages, disadvantages. I take the non-shark option, right? <laughs> Fair enough. But we landed and, you know, your head is so used to space where even the slightest little touch says, oh, I'm going somewhere. And so landing and I mean, it's really provocative. Your head is just like, where am I? And I looked out the window expecting that we were like rolling over and over and over. Right, right. And, and I looked and the grass was just like sticking straight up. I'm like, I guess we've stopped. <laughs> And there's actually a picture of like my eye looking out the spacecraft. <laughs> okay, so when you crack the door and you smell Earth's atmosphere, is that as awesome as I hope it is? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mostly it's what, I mean, what is pretty neat is that hatch opens and the face and the arm that comes down to help you out is a face and an arm that you know. Oh, this wow. is the same people that taught us survival training. And, and so we know them and they, you know, they pull you out. And in, in my case, it was um, it was funny because they're looking and, you know, we're going to go down like a little, they put a ring up there. We're going to actually slide down a slide. It's a slide I'd never seen. And <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is new. And they go, look. And so you, I looked around and usually if people are going to catch you, they'd be looking at you. They'd be going, yeah, come on, come yeah, this yeah. way. And I, I, I turned back around and go, they're not ready. Like they don't have the look you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, go, go. And I'm like, you're a little bewildered. I go, okay. And it turns out that everybody thought somebody else was going to say ready, set. And, but when I started sliding, they did actually catch me. And then one guy, usually two people carry the astronaut over, but one guy decided I was small and he would carry me. And I think he was sorry. I mean, that space suit does weigh a little bit. You know? I love, it's easy to think that we've like moved way beyond this. But in many ways, we're still utilizing the same, as you said, physics is the same as it was when exactly. we were doing this. And, and I love that, I mean, we sent people like John Glenn, you know, out, you know, into orbit and back. And it was because real people, the computers, these women, yeah. you know, mostly women, right, were doing these calculations of how to get people to space and back again safely. And his flight is pivotal in that it was the beginning of having these big IBM computers that were like bigger than the doorways of the rooms to get in there. And John Glenn is famous for having said, you know, I don't want to go until you verify those calculations. And I want that woman, the really smart one, to do it. And that was Katherine Johnson. Unbelievable. Katherine Coleman Johnson. Actually, we share a name. I didn't know that. We do. That's a great story. Katie, thank you so much. I, hearing your stories even makes this more physicalized for me. I really appreciate it. It's, it's, it's like this spectrum. And it, I love the fact that it started and continues and it, I think, never ends. Yeah, I totally agree. It's really inspiring. I talk a lot about how standing in front of an object as amazing as this Mercury capsule physicalizes the American space program in a way that few other things can. Like this 2D interaction we're having, it just doesn't quite suffice. So if you'd like a 3D interaction that doesn't involve traveling to Washington, D.C., you can get it because we have an episode of Tested VR where I am looking at the Mercury capsule here, John Glenn's Friendship 7, and a link is in the description below. And I have a story to tell you about Jamie Heineman to connect all up with this. Way back in 1991, sorry, 1993, when they were first starting up Robot Wars and Jamie wanted to build a robot to enter into it, uh, that robot would eventually be Blendo. I was working for Jamie and he said to me, I have this idea for a robot that would be centrifugally powered. And what Jamie's conception was is that he'd build this sort of upside down walk, a flying saucer of a, of a, of a weight on a bearing and that he would use a motor to spin up the outside of this thing to some incredible speed, like 10,000 revolutions per minute, 10,000 RPM. 
with the idea that that would be enough speed that you'd remove the motor and it would spin under its own power, just like my disc sander spins down for like minutes. And since each match was only three minutes, Jamie was thinking I could spin it up and use the centrifugal force of its spinning to keep it powered for a whole match. And I could, you know, tap off that spinning to drive some wheels and things like that. So he thought about this idea for a while and checked with a friend of his who was a physicist and said, is such a thing possible? And his friend said, okay, what, what kind of steel are you thinking about? Jamie was like, I was thinking that the bottom ring would be like half inch steel plate. And his friend, the physicist said, okay, at 10,000 RPM for a three foot diameter half inch steel plate, it would be spinning so fast, traveling so quickly on the outer rim that it would catch fire and explode just from friction with the air. So th think about this for a second. The steel would burst into flames from friction from the air. Just do me a favor, rub your hands together for a second and you feel, you feel your hands getting warm. This is the oldest lesson we learned in school about how friction works and friction imparts heat, how the whole universe works. And Jamie's robot bursting into flames from friction with the air bears directly on this heat shield here because we're always told that upon re-entry, it gets really hot. But I'm not sure it's fully explained to everybody exactly why it gets hot. And the reason it gets hot is because this object, as it's re-entering Earth's atmosphere, is traveling like 15 times the speed of your average bullet. 15 times as fast as your average bullet as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. And as it does, it encounters the molecules that make up our atmosphere. And those molecules start to get more and more numerous as the atmosphere thickens and they are bouncing off the bottom of that spacecraft and creating heat by friction. And that friction is so significant that they have to include this giant fat frangible plate on the underside of the spacecraft in order so that it can take that heat and not burn the astronauts up and cook them in the tin can that these capsules are. And Katie Coleman tells me, on the Soyuz capsule, you feel that heat. Even today, that heat is such an extreme event that you can't be fully shielded from it. You still feel it on the Soyuz spacecraft. Something about thinking about friction with the air causing all that damage, it physicalizes this for me in a really, like, a special way. And I thought you'd want to hear that story.